Hello and welcome my friends once again to Creatives Flow with a VO. I am Tim Dadabo, I'm the VO, the curious VO, who just loves to dig into the gray matter of people who create commercials, promos, animations, TV narration, and all the stuff we see on screens big and small. Well today, we're gonna get off of those screens and we're gonna talk to the creators of something that helps us voiceovers connect. Long ago and far away, kiddies, there used to be something called ISDN. And if you weren't able to be in a particular room, meaning the studio, you used ISDN to connect from wherever you were to wherever they were recording. Well, along came Robert Marshall and his big brain, and eventually he connected with Rebecca Wilson, and they created Source Elements. Now, if you're a working voiceover, I know you know what this is, but these are the creators, and this is their journey to creating what was once an idea into an actual product that we use pretty much every day. Now, initially, just so you know, I was only expecting to interview Robert Marshall, but he surprised me with Rebecca Wilson from wherever the world she is right now. Uh, if you're wondering where her accent is from, she's originally from New Zealand. So anyway, without any further blather from me, please welcome to the show, Miss Rebecca Wilson and Mr. Robert Marshall. Rebecca, Robert, what's going on? Hi, Tim. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for joining. This is really, really cool of you to do this. Well, uh, I have some time, uh, and it's nice to catch up and say hi. I'm completely unprepared for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I'm prepared. I'm also unprepared. I haven't talked on a podcast for a long time, so you don't know, hit me with hard questions. This is when the magic happens. <laughs> So uh, yeah, I, I I think people people are really interested in in how creative thinkers dial into their creativity, um, how they solve problems when they come up. You know, where where do you get your juice? So thank you guys both for joining me. Um, this is really cool of you guys to jump in here. I guess uh, let's begin where we always begin at the beginning. So tell us where you're originally from. I uh, Robert, I I believe you are a Chicago native. Yes. Yep, Evanston. And by the way, thank you for having us. Oh, of course. Yes, man. very pleasure. Thank you so much. And, and and of course, we're hearing a lovely New Zealand accent from Rebecca. Oh, nicely done. You looked that up before. Uh, you were going to say South African or no, Australian or no. Finland. And, and I'm cheating because I happen to know where you are. <laughs> are well, there? you don't actually, not physically. Most people don't know where I am at any one time. I do like to travel. It's not possible to know. I was going to say quick. I'm a, I'm a quark. Quick question. Do you know where you are? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I don't know how fast I'm going. <laughs> Brilliant right, answer. You're, not, you're, you're only allowed to know one, but not both. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and it's funny because to my to my un, you know to my American ear, New Zealanders often sound like South African. Australians yes. do not, but New Zealanders oh. do. Um, well, so yeah. yeah, it depends on the part of the country. Yeah. Yes, I I just think it 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 just all sounds Commonwealth except for can, can Canadians. But yeah, it doesn't sound and then it it don't sound nothing like Kentucky. So you're good. <laughs> <laughs> so, what Robert when. When and where did you get your start as an audio engineer, and really, who gave you your first break? Oh my gosh! Um, really, it was kind of in high school. I uh, was in some bands, and I had gotten a four-track reel-to-reel um, that my uncle had fixed. My my neighbor gave it to me. My uncle fixed it, and then I ended up recording some uh, my my band in high school and um, some other bands a little bit, and then. Um, I was in the studio, so some friends of ours went into like a real studio and I just wanted to go there and, um, ended up making friends with the owner of the studio. Um, I had actually ended up solving a sync problem, funny enough, with Vision and the 24 track recorder there where they all gave up and they all went to lunch and I just sat there and got something working for an hour because I'd been working with Vision and sequencing as part of recording. And uh, so then I ended up interning there, um, end of high school, like seems like a year and a half, not quite two. And um, that kind of changed everything. And funny enough, I would say a lot, the nuts and bolts of recording, um, probably learned more from him. Scott Exum was the engineer there. Oh, sure. I know I Scott. Did college. Dude, you he know recorded Scott? my first band in, in his basement in Evanston. Well, that's the studio I worked at. Yeah. Back in 1982, totally. three? 
Yeah, he's in California now. Oh, God. Yeah. That's, you just made me have a major flashback, dude. <laughs> I hope it was a good one. Yeah. <laughs> so, so a nerd from the onset. Now, Rebecca, how in the world were you an audio engineer as well? How did you jump in into uh, source uh, source elements? Uh, I had gone to university for like traditional composition, orchestra, ensemble, contemporary music, and then um, there just fell in love with um, computer music. You know, um, sort of European style computer music. Um, and then the, realized that the best way to write computer music is to write computer software. So that's how I got into that. And so I had, you know, in terms of sound engineering, we were using Pro Tools. So I knew Pro Tools um, since the mid-90s. But um, definitely I'm not a sound engineer. Like, please don't ask me to EQ anything. Um, I <laughs> will be very creative. I hear that. And um, <laughs> uh, so, when, yeah, when Robert and I met, it was like a collision of worlds because I also love the internet as a programmer. Um, I did a lot of internet programming. And it was one of those, like, kismet things, like, you know, both of us love sound. I love the internet. He loves sound engineering. And there was a need really so apparent. Um, and, uh, yeah, good, talk about good timing for all of us. Absolutely. You know, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, because when Source Connect first took off, it had a bit of a, you know, it had a bit of a, a hiccup. Let's let's say let's say what that was. It was a bit of a hiccup, where the sound would cut in and out a bit. So whatever you guys worked out, or whatever, maybe the pipe got bigger, but everything got so much better in a very short amount of time. And I think that's what finally gave you guys your leg up. And ISDN just has been slowly slinking away like a like a you know sad snake. Yeah, I I I think it is timing, but funny enough. Um... What it was is Source Connect was just ahead of the curve. Um, we started within a year of Skype starting. And really, I think Skype is probably most people's experience or first experience with real-time audio over the internet. Not a broadcast, but actually have a conversation over the internet. And Skype had its own problem. Source Connect was trying to do a lot more in terms of fidelity and um, right. complexity. So. It took, I mean, we started in 2004, 2005, and it seems like it wasn't until 2007, really not 2009, where the internet got fast enough consistently, where where you didn't have to have some corporate account and, and you could pull it, you know, pull off a stable connection from a home internet connection. I mean, when we started, broadband was DSL with like, you know, 500k up and maybe three megs down essentially <laughs> i remember the original documentation please have at least one meg up and down yeah, you know before robert and i sort of talked about source connect i'd been doing you know, streaming music i'd been uh, in, in europe at a um, music institute where it was using the internet to stream concerts and you know this is very early days of quick time um, you know, you'd have like five or 10 or well, 30 second delays, actually. And so, you know, then talking to Robert about doing, using the internet in real time was um, yeah, very yeah. compelling, very compelling. Because also I'm from an island that's very far away. I don't know uh, any of the listeners here who've been there, but it's a long way. You don't realize until you get on that plane and you don't get off for 24 hours. I mean, right, it is right. like the end of the world. It's like going to Mars. So you get there and then, you know, imagine uh, how to communicate with the rest of the world before the internet was, um, you know, 30 days for magazines to arrive from Europe or, you know, television, whatever the, you know, the TV stations wanted to play. So the internet really was a game changer totally for, for us islanders. Sure. And especially for what all of us do, you know. Um, I was so overjoyed to have Source Connect when I worked with Discovery uh, from the UK, because um, when I first started the show with Discovery, I was working with, um, I was actually only working with Washington, D.C., and I had to go to a recording studio because the Discovery Channel would only use ISDN. And I was like, okay, well, um, I ditched mine, so I'm going to go to a studio and you're going to pay for it. And they said, okay, good. So I did that. And within one year, they said, you have your own studio, right? And you're using Source Connect? And I said, yeah. They said, we're going to have you work directly 
with a production company. They're in the UK and they use Source Connect. I said, okay, fine. So for the next nine years, that's how we connected. And it was flawless. Absolutely. Right. And you weren't paying $5 a minute for it. Right. Exactly. I mean, when I first put in my studio, you had, if you were going to do certain types of work, you had to have ISDN. Um, because you guys hadn't dreamed this up yet. And it's, it's funny because you guys beat my buddy to the punch. When I, I, I have a little aside story for you. My buddy's an IT guru. And um, when I first bought my box, I didn't realize you had to code it or program it or something like that. And I called him and I said, hey, do you know anything about ISDN boxes? And he said, yeah. And I said, can you code mine? I said, it won't receive or send until you do that. Robert owns it now, by the way. Um, yes. And um, <laughs> your box is in my basement. And uh, he said, "Yeah, sure." So he came over and he worked his voodoo on. It. He goes, "What are you using this for?" And I told him, "He goes, why aren't you guys using VoIP?" And I said, "What's VoIP?" And he said, "Voice over IP." He goes, "It'd be so much faster and cleaner." I said, "Dude, invent it." I said, "You'll you'll be a millionaire." So that's why Robert lives in the oh. lavish life in, of, of Evanston now. <laughs> And you can afford to live on an island in the middle of the Pacific. Oh, I can afford to leave the island in the middle of the Pacific. <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's that's kind of funny. Uh, and just so the audience knows real quick, um, when Robert mentions another country, he means a studio. And ISDN is the way we used to speak to each other. Or actually, if you were long distance and needed to record with a studio that was also long distance, ISDN used to be the way we could connect with one another. And it was so clear you could record on the other end. Just so you guys know. Um, so how many iterations did you guys play with before you really even knew you had something? The first version, I remember... The the latency was crazy. It was like 30 seconds or a minute. And I remember actually thinking, like, not one computer we have here has enough RAM for all that audio. Mm -hmm. So where is it getting stored while it's taking its time to get here? And uh, it was it was interesting. Um, the, the first version was version one. I believe it was mono only. Um, and then we did stereo. And then we added the queue manager. And then we added... Uh, oh, remote transport sync. No, 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 remote transport sync was before the queue manager, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, remote transport And Source sync. Live. Yeah, I remember Source Live. And then we did Source Live before that, yep. And I, it's funny, I can't remember the order of events, so, but queue manager was in there along with Source Live. I, it was fairly early on, I think. <laughs> by the third, but, like, by, by the, the third iteration, because like you turned me on to it right away. You said, hey, mm. Tim, would you like to try this? Hugely oh, popular, yeah. yeah. Is I use it all the time. I teach in Source Nexus. It's just amazing to be able to pipe in, you know, Pro Tools into what we use Microsoft Teams at school. And yeah, it's, it's no boundaries. And folks, everybody that's listening, we're using it right now. That's how I'm bringing them in. Source Nexus is how I'm bringing them into my recording software so that you can hear them a lot cleaner than past shows. Thank you very much. Was breaking through, you know, maybe even breaking past ISDN your initial plan, uh, or or did you did you even really know what you had when you first? I guess it sounds like you did. So so for me at first, I thought it was mainly you know you kind of do things selfishly, honestly. So I was just solving a problem for myself, and I didn't at first. It wasn't really thought of as a like every talent's going to have this at home. It was a studio to studio thing. And then um, we came out with the standard version, and that was the first one that was like kind of more meant for talent, um, like didn't have all these extra features and was simplified. Um, and I think that's the first time, like I, I began realizing it was at least like a compliment. We um, like it began being used for bridging a lot. Um, talent were excited because they could basically get away from like the talent like yourself who had ISDN at their house. To a certain degree, they were like they couldn't leave, and so this allowed them. We we like people began setting up their own self bridges, and then we right. um, ended right. up doing a bridging service and things like that. So it kind of, um, to some degree, took a life of its own, or it, it it had its own needs once it was created. But the initial incarnation was simple, like studio to studio thing, and. I, I don't even honestly know if it was to take over ISDN, but it was certainly to control the costs and to 
be able to improve the quality because the idea was the internet was wide open and higher bit rates. Right. And right. also clearly where things were going. Right. Um, Mobility. Sure. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, that was for me. Go ahead, Rebecca. That's how I, you know, that that's how, you know, those early days and I was um, still living in, in New Zealand, you know, I had a, a, a Wi-Fi, like a long distance wireless router on my roof because even then there were certain places you couldn't even get cable, but we were near the mountains. So um, I remember just 2005, I'm talking to people in Europe and the highest quality, and I could put my, open my window and my microphone would pick up the birds and the sound of, you know, insects in the grass, and I'm playing it back to people in real time. Yeah, you know, something <laughs> very extraordinary about that. Yeah, absolutely. It, it never, I, never happened before. I'm sure the light bulb went on within a really short amount of time. Hey, look what we got here. You know, a lot of people began doing cool things. I remember the first time, and this was still within the first less than five years, probably the first three years or so. It was, it was more like um, three, but, and I know because I was, I was all over it, and I was pushing it by then. I was pushing it on all the other actors that I knew. So you could get these wireless USB modems. Like, I mean, we're talking about like 300k up and down, maybe a meg like 3G. And mm -hmm. I remember hooking up with a radio guy from, I think, Clear Channel, but he was driving around his parking lot uh, talking to me, super clear, with his laptop. And and these days, that seems like no big deal at all. That was, he was like, remotes, oh my gosh, like this is the possibilities. And the other one I remember, which was a few years later, but Rebecca source connected with me from a plane. And, wow. And I remember like thinking that was incredibly cool. Her private plane, I know. Yeah. So you no. guys all know <laughs> no, she paid like the $50 probably at that time for the internet service on the plane. I don't know if you remember that, Rebecca. Do you? Oh, yeah. There's a recording still on our Facebook page somewhere. You can hear the plane behind me. I'm like, I'm on a plane. Someone's right. recording me in Chicago. <laughs> That's right. I was well, like, the, this is not very useful. There's lots of noise on a plane. <laughs> it was super loud. I was like, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> it, it, bring in the uh, cue baby cry in row four. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> ding, ding. All right. And, and mm -hmm. since then, I mean, crazy places, I have source connected um, in a ski chalet on the top of Beaver Creek. Uh, and sure. you know, like, yeah, it's, it's like now it's like the internet's everywhere. It's not a big deal as much. So it's, it's kind of, I've source true. connected sessions, shorties, but thank goodness from hotel rooms, which was impossible to do. Okay. This is what, this is what, one of the reasons why everybody jumped on the bandwagon because do you remember Joe Cipriano? Sure do. Yeah. He, that's right. He did a commercial for you guys. He used to have to bring a, a, a portable ISDN box with him just to go on vacation, and they used to have to hook it up so that he could do. Yeah, they'd get hotels to do correct. that. He's he was a pioneer. He did he did a voiceover for some. I'm, I'm sure that he doesn't even want his clients to know this, maybe, but like pulled over side of the highway, source connected from his car. Sure, and a yacht. He did it in a, a yacht, yacht off the, in the Mediterranean. That's right. He did a cruise ship. The delay was crazy off the cruise ship. It was like two seconds, you know, but I it think. got done. Yeah, mm -hmm. he bridged. He bridged. Yeah, I think he bridged on that one. But yeah, he definitely did a Source Connect session from a cruise ship. I think yeah, he was I the mean, first. The I'm again, sure. the craziest place yeah. I've had to do was from a hotel room in a closet in a hotel room, and of course it was Wi-Fi, so it was a you know there was a few hiccups here and there, but other than that, crystal clear. And that was again that that was what finally started selling people because we could basically be available, if you will wherever there was strong internet. Speaking of available, I regret I um, have another call I must jump to. It's been really great to talk to you, Tim, and I um, want to listen to the rest of this podcast, and I hope we can talk again. You too, Rebecca. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs> yes, fantastic. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. And on we go. So what are, you know, and we've already touched on it a little bit, but what are some of the other packages source elements have come that, that source elements is coming up with over the years and and what are their functions just so people know so um i mean there's there's a lot of lower end products or i shouldn't say lower end but just less expensive specific uh problem solvers we we made one called source zip for example and what it basically was for is to be able to take a pro tools or any daw session and compress it make it really small send it to somebody and they can re-expand it 
but all the audio files and everything doesn't know that it was compressed and re-expanded because okay. zip files don't make audio sessions very small, but source zip uses basically MPEG to compress the audio. So it's lossy, but in many situations you just needed someone to get a version of what you're doing, add a few things. I like the things that you're listening to is just monitoring. You don't have to keep those. I have the originals. What we didn't realize, for example, was like, okay, here's this thing that was mainly for ADR people to send a reference session to somebody really quick. Um, it began selling in Egypt and the United Arab Emirates and, and all over the Middle East and other countries where apparently, even though you have an internet connection, you're charged by how much bandwidth you use. We, we made um, a talkback plugin for um, basically Pro Tools that emulates a hardware talkback switch um, that you find in any studio because it was just a necessity when you're doing remote connections, but because now it's so pos possible to be all desktop oriented. Um, as an engineer, on a simple radio se session, you could just be on a laptop and headphones and record Tim Dadabo. And well, the one thing you need is, or it's better to have is a talkback button. So here's a software talkback button. We made that. Right. I made another one for the volume controller. What happens with surround sound is that they came out with like, you know, four channel surround sound with Knight Rider and in the eighties and then 5.1 and then 6.1 and then 7.1. And they kept on changing and all the monitor controllers would have to keep up, which were hardware so made a simple plug-in monitor controller. wasn't too popular, but um, is useful, especially now that things are kind of going with VR and a whole bunch of channels in some cases. And then we made Nexus, right. both both basic and adv and uh, what what's the other one? We dropped basic and we just made one now. But we had basic and and pro at the time, and we just kind of put it all as source Nexus at this time because we were. As you can tell, we were making a lot of products. So so now we're kind of going through a thing where we're just trying to consolidate and make what's important and uh, not necessarily make like every last idea that's in your head because we're, uh, you know, like the the main thing that we're known for primarily is Source Connect, as you know. And so that's a little bit more where the uh, the focus is. And, and those other plugins were never like completely the focus. They were just problem solvers. Sure. Um, so all those things, you know, it, it's hard to say exactly, but they, they become either, uh, features or they're, they're problem solvers. And then as time goes on, those problems get solved in other ways. Um, for, for example, source zip maybe isn't needed so much now because the internet's really fast <laughs> and you can send a lot of right. data without having to compress it. Right, right. You can, I can basically send an entire pro tool session, depending on size over the internet. Yeah. It's it, like, like it literally came like a realization at one point where I, I was working with an internet connection that was so fast that the time it took to compress it was longer than the time it would take to just send the entire file without compressing right, it. Right, right, right. <laughs> so things catch up and products are no longer necessary or they get done in other ways. And uh, yeah. Is there a video one yet or can you see video through source? Yeah. Yeah. So, so source live source live is our video um, platform. And that allows, it has two parts to the video. So there's a chat video for clients, um, so to speak, so that they can um, just join a session using any web browser. And then within it is a really high resolution video playback. So it's not like Zoom video. It keeps really tight sync and plays back a very smooth frame rate for what's coming out of basically Pro Tools or whatever, like, you know, Media Composer or whatever platform is being worked on. So that video is high quality the decision makers, you know, if it's an ADR session, they can they can look at it and see sync right away. Um, sure, and drop their voice in there or whatever. Right, and and so I'll even have a talent join in on the on that, and all I do with the talent is I just have them mute the video so they're seeing it, but they're getting all their audio through Source Connect, and that allows, for instance, for example, a read to picture, even if it's. <clears throat> Like sometimes it's not even necessary to be super in sync on like per frame. Sometimes you're just reading a spot and you just want to get an idea of where the supers are happening to what you're voicing. And that allows you sure. to see that at the same time, which when you're in studio, often they have a monitor in the booth for you. So brings that back. You can read their lips a lot easier that way too, you know, um, mm -hmm. and see how you can drop it in or reshape your mouth. It's coming from a voice actor, reshape your mouth to match their mouth a little tighter or a little better, unless, of course, it's your face. So it's, it sounds like it fits, right? Right, exactly. And just, uh, again, for the audience, 
ADR stands for Automated Dialogue Replacement. So, you know, okay, so then an actor does a part and his mic, for whatever reason, just didn't pick up what they were saying. And then they would hire a knucklehead like me to come in and say, hey, <clears throat> you sound just like this guy. Can you replace this particular line? I watch his mouth. I read into a mic. They give me one, two, three. I'm in and recording and problem is solved. Right. Or or other things like dubbing all the various m- movies and shows that we see right. in other languages. Um, so there's there's that use of, of dubbing, um, actors doing the version that you watch on the airplane <laughs> right. with all the swear words removed. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> or changing the the lines after the fact. I, I was just watching the thing with Top Gun, and, and one of the really interesting things about it was that half the stories in Top Gun got written, or not half, I don't know, some chunk of them got written after the fact when they were editing and they needed to backfill stuff in. And hey, get Tom Cruise in, because there's a mask over his face. Oh, wow. So right. we can just right. put whatever we want in there. <laughs> Oh, that's just that's just ripe for somebody to do shit with on on Facebook. <laughs> Son of a bitch. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the, that's right. The Tom Cruise knockoff guy. So here, here's a, here's a crappy question, but I have to ask: Is there anything you guys ever tried that fizzled out? I mean, did you have a great idea or concept and it just didn't work out, or uh, did that end up being a springboard to something even better or completely different? Mm, um. I mean, sounds I like did, Source okay, Live is a is a perfect th- example because it didn't start out being video, did it? No, Source Live was just a way to actually what it w- was literally is a way to mix music and radio spots and anything that was audio only with clients who didn't have to be there, so you could just say, "Hey, check this out." But get away from that workflow of let me make a file, let me upload it, let you download it. Okay, get back to me with an right, email. Right, right, right. I used to use it to play people's right. stuff. Right. So, so that that's where Source Live started, and then we made Source Live with video in 2014, and it was a huge task because it was really hard to keep the video and audio in sync and keep the latency low, and certain technologies were not available. That that is another example of timing. We made that we made the first video first version of source live with video right before some other technologies became available um you know things like webrtc and so we were using hls instead and it was higher latency but it was still low ish latency like instead of 30 seconds to stream it was 2 to maybe 5 seconds or so and that which is that fantastic. was great and it but it didn't quite catch on because the latency was high enough to be just annoying enough. And so Source Live did okay. It solved the problem for some people, but it wasn't like, oh, we're all leaving the studios and we're never going to go in the studio again. And then right, right, in right. Co- it was it, it was a it was a right. tool. It was a helpful and tool. And then in COVID, um, we were, you know, like some other technologies came out, some 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 other platforms proved that there's there's um essentially things we knew about, but we just didn't have the time. And then in COVID, it was just like, we, you have to have the time. And we had some extra resources at that point. And so we made a new, more modern version of Source Live, that, where now the latency is about a third of a second, essentially like you and I are talking. And you wow. hit play and the clients see perfect video. And that's really opened up a lot of options um, and changes the way you do things, perhaps. So sessions that, ADR sessions that used to be done where, you have to have the video on your side. I have the video on my side. It's the same way we did ADR on ISDN remotely. Essentially, the audio would go across the internet and the systems would sync with each other. So you would see the internet audio mm-hmm. in sync with your video playing on your side. And and you were using, right. so, you know, things like uh, SMPTE timecode or what's called linear timecode to, uh, to, to lock those systems together. And then we built RTS. But now with the ability to stream video pretty efficiently, it's like, okay, well, let's just stream you the video too. And let's not worry about locking the picture. And now you don't need Pro Tools there. So now you can sit on the beach and monitor a ADR session. So it started out where you could sit on the beach and monitor a voice record session, but trying to do ADR, you had to go to a studio. Now to do ADR, you can sit on the beach and you can be on an iPad pretty much. (laughs) I don't recommend it. There's still... Yeah. I was just going to say that that's not to say that all of you directors out there should do that, but you have the option. <laughs> no, whatever happened with your, um, I, it was an ISDN box that you guys were kind of developing. I mean, I know that 
Is that still yeah, a thing? Yeah, or? yeah, we made that. So that was, it is still a thing. So VISDN, um, it's just literally what we do is we have a box that 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 we made. It has a card. Um, think of it like a modem that takes the ISDN signal from your ISDN box from 1995, and it converts it from serial data to packet data, which is the way the internet communicates. And we so we basically chop up the the line into rows. We send the rows over to our data center where we also have um, we we buy ISDN lines on behalf of the clients, and then we put the data back into a row back onto the ISDN network, and essentially gives you an ISDN line that you can use with your ISDN hardware. Except you don't need the local ISDN or the you don't need the local phone company to give you the ISDN line because that. It's now done through it's, the internet. Right, at least, yeah, at least one virtually. chunk of it from you to the to the ISDN line is a hop over the internet, and then you're back onto the real ISDN network. Well, because to, I mean, I guess some some people still need to use it, obviously, or you wouldn't keep pursuing it. Yeah, I have I have a bridge coming up in two days that someone's using it for, and I I see it being used um, all over the place. And and funny enough, those those Zephyrs people love them as phone patches too. <laughs> They're just because they're just like wired, you know, like people have that setup, which is like the Mackie mixer and they have their ISDN box and their computer and they just, you know, they're set up and they, that's the way they did it. That's the way they do it now. I think it was you that turned me on to Google phone. Oh uh, yeah. As a phone patch. Totally. That's my phone patch now. Um, you know, so that's, that's all. If somebody says they want to do a phone patch, Google assigns you your own phone number and I just run my audio device through it and away we go. Yeah, you use Nexus for that, or you just you just put your mic straight into it. I just put my mic straight into it. I I suppose I could use Nexus, but I mean, I just go straight through, and they can hear me on their end, pretty darn clear. And I just record. Obviously, I'll be recording anyway. So, the reason to use Nexus would be, which is sort of the case sometimes on phone patches, where they're you're recording yourself now, and you're usually in a situation where you're uploading files because obviously the phone is not good enough. Um, but sometimes, I don't know if you run into this, clients are like, you do take one, take two, take three. They're like, can you play take two? And if your mic is the only thing going into the phone, then you're like, I'll hold my speakers up to the microphone. Um, if you're using Nexus, you could send Pro Tools out into the phone that way, as well as your microphone out to the phone. So you can do playbacks for them. I'm definitely going to take that into account. Um, because So I can steer Nexus into the, into the phone out into the phone input you could also use nexus for the phone output and you could record your clients basically so they're like you didn't read it okay, happy gotcha. enough you can play back their direction when they said please read it low key <laughs> isn't this what you said and mr like, hmm? did what you said <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right no <laughs> you can be like william shatner <laughs> like no i'm gonna do it the way you told me to do it well, all right, now we're going to get into about, you know the other part of this, the creative maker questions, and that is what gets you out of your box, meaning when and where do you get your lightning bolt moments of ideas and inspiration? Uh, riding a bicycle, taking a walk. I mean, what, what does it just hit you in the middle of the night? When and how does that happen? Usually it's like learning about tangential stuff. So um, you're, I mean, who knows? You're watching a video, reading an article about some other technology entirely. Um, and then you, you see how that relates in some way to what you do or what you love, you know, audio music, you know, sound design. And you're um, like, Oh, that could be useful. So, you, you know, like whatever you're reading about AI, how can that contribute to our space or how can it be a disruptor. Do you do you um, dive right in, or do you like write stuff down first? No, I I think ideas ideas percolate for years, and and I I you write stuff down, but ultimately, like writing stuff down is just a way of like cementing it in your head mm -hmm. more, and then you, you lose the paper, but you still the idea goes away and comes back, and if it's a good idea, it comes back. If it's a bad idea, it probably goes away. I mean, Source Connect is an idea, probably. I was talking about that for at least two or three years before it was able to happen. VISDN, I was talking about that. Like that took many more years to get off the ground because it was finding it's it's always it's a lot about finding the the people that 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 see it in in the same way that you see it, for example. So 
you know, VISDN was was originally like this kind of side project because Source Elements was a little bit the antithesis to <laughs> ISDN, right? Absolutely. I mean, it was it was basically um, it, what it became was an ISDN killer, and it, it, I mean, because when right. I first hooked up my exactly. ISDN, it was it was expensive at fifty bucks a month, you know. That's cheap. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's that. I was like, wow, it's fifty dollars a month for a for this. Well, you you get two lines, sir. You have you have two lines come. Oh, okay. Well, you know, and they had to run the two lines to my house and all that stuff, and you know, and and then um, I used it for about three, maybe five years, and then I said, I'm hardly ever using this thing, man. I'm more often going downtown to do sessions, and and the promo people are okay with me recording stuff and sending it to them. So then I, I ditched it. Right. Well, then I got another gig that I needed it for, so I reinitialized it. By then we were doing bridges for that, I remember. Or for Yeah, it was like a hundred and a quarter. If to, to, to you know what I mean, and plus what it cost to turn flip a switch, literally flip a switch. Right. And they and they wanted like three times as much money for it. Which now. is why you guys what, and, and if you stuck with AT and T, which AT and T is the incumbent in Chicago, so I'm pretty of sure course. you had an AT and T line they would have moved the price up every year until you get to people in Texas paying a thousand dollars a month mm-hmm. for an ISDN line, and and AT and T literally didn't want the customers. Like they, I think they will admit they were raising the price to get people off mm-hmm. of the ISDN. They line. wanted to ditch it. You'd, you'd call them up and complain, and they'd be like, "Yeah, well, we have a uh, universe." Right. Well, and and <laughs> apparently they were using it for large data transfer. You know, that's what it was originally for, was large data transfer. Oh, it's all over the place. What, what, what was the secure phone on the president's desk for years? ISDN. Okay. Yeah, because it was person to person. Yeah, it was used by doctors to look at x-rays uh, quickly across, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. it, was, it, was, it was used for video teleconferencing. It was, I mean, in, in many ways from its design, it is superior to the internet, but it's also kind of like over-designed. The beauty of the internet is that it can screw up and keep on going. Whereas right. whereas the phone network, it screws up and you're like, doo, 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 like you've lost your connection. And like, ugh. So, it, and it's gone. Right. Or, or they ran a backhoe through the line that connects you and your client in Columbus. Right. And its capacity you know, you, you is just way never lower because of the way it allocates channels. It's so dedicated that it it's, it's well-designed, but it's overly designed in the internet for its faults gets so much more done <laughs> with, you know, it's just like a better way about going about it. And it has some downsides, but the downsides are easily worked around or just pretty much ignored. Right. Right. All right. So very last question. And then I'm going to ask you something that I did not send you on purpose. We're going to do lightning round questions because I do that with everyone. So our last question is, um, What's next for Source Elements? Uh, if there's anything new on the horizon you can talk about, if so, please explain what it is. Uh, we're mainly working on Source Connect 4, which is a sort of modernized version of Source Connect. All the same stuff, even better. Some new features, which I probably can't talk about directly. But um, I, th- I think you can imagine uh, being more flexible, available in, in more places, um, and added features like that. So Source Connect 4 is something that we were working on and then the pandemic changed everything. And so we realized just because of some of our past way, way that software goes, it was better to drop it and redesign it with the new reality in mind. Um, so we did that and, and we're hoping to have that out vaguely this year and i saw that uh you guys have a new version of source connect out now because uh because people people like me who have apples keep changing you know they keep changing their os and you have to play catch up with that too so yeah right that's a patch in comparison to yeah that's a exactly monterey um through through a loop at us um and so we had to we had to fix that yeah 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 Okay, so now on to our lightning round questions. Let me make sure everything's still happy here. All right, here we go. Robert, if you weren't doing this, what would you be doing? Skiing. Okay, there you go. And that's quick and easy. (laughs) (laughs) Professionally? I mean, like a professional downhill Olympic skier? Uh, If I could go back in time, maybe I'd try to pursue something like that. I, I do love to ski. Ski instructor. 
Um, That's a- teaching teaching young snow bunnies how to ski. There you go. It's a legit <laughs> career, man. <laughs> Dude, I, I'm telling you, I know when I went to uh, Whistler Blackcomb, all the guys you know, that were my, because I'm a mountain biker, all the guys yeah. that guided me in the winter, they're ski instructors in the, in the summer, they're mountain bike guides. So there you go. It's, it's an incredible <laughs> life, actually. Yeah. The, the, dude, the second dude that took me out, I went out for a two-day package. The second dude that took me out lived in a trailer in the mountains in Whistler. Yeah. That's I'm it. Jealous. That was his life. That was his life. All right. So now where do you see, where is Source Connect going to be in the next five years? I I, th- I think we're going to be just continuing to try to address the the issues and the things that our customers need, and always trying to take on the really hard challenges. The the um, you know, not not taking easy off the shelf solutions. Um, I, I see a lot of companies really taking basically telephony and repackaging it for pro use. Um, and 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 I think that we're we're looking a little bit more at really solving the hard problems uh, in a professional media context. So real-time media creators have the tools that they need and they're not being forced to use, um, you know, VoIP solutions and, and repackaged VoIP solutions for that same stuff. By that, you mean uh, like Zoom stuff and Skype stuff? And- Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Okay. Office, yeah, yeah, yeah. office connectivity for what is really a, a, a much tougher task. And so the audience knows, for those of you not in our crazy little business. We need it to sound broadcast quality. And anybody that's ever been on a Zoom out there uh, knows that it can sound gerbily. That's what I call it. It's like the gerbils. And it, that just cannot happen when you're doing, you know, a one hour voiceover session or, you know, a one hour on camera session where you're doing ADR or, you know, God help you, a long TV narration yeah. bit, bit. It's got to sound crystal clear it's it's the difference where it like zoom and skype and all those systems their their mission in life is to preserve a conversation and they're designed for exactly that so they will do things like take words and drag them out and go really quick after that to catch back up right and that might help the communication but later when you're trying to deal with that media in terms of production that's a problem. Sure. And so, yep. Yep. and that, and all the other things that it does in the background, I, I kind of joke sometimes that like a lot of the systems on Chrome, they're making up more audio than they're actually transmitting. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, those we're just trying to make like, uh, and, and for what they do, solutions. they're great. I mean, really right, for exactly. what they do, they're great. And, and, and that was a great way of saying it. That was a great sentence that they're continuing the conversation, the eye to eye face to face conversations, you know, right. especially now, you know, Right now in this pan- pandemia. <laughs> when does it end? <laughs> the land of pandemia. Where will it end? With a stick up your nose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Please. And a stick in your arm. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Now, the last, of course, where do you see yourself in five years? What are you going to be doing in five years, Robert Marshall? Um, I... Gosh. Okay. So probably my my daughter will be in college and that will open up some possibilities for me to move about if I want. And I think the whole um, remote thing will actually continue quite a bit. So you might find me at Whistler in a trailer home doing all three things I love. Um, <laughs> you know, I'll make some music. I'll, I'll definitely... Um, keep on doing spots and doing sound design and um and then I'll ski and uh I don't know that's a dream <laughs> yeah it's that that's a great dream to have man i mean i i, I can't imagine that putting a booth or you know putting a, an audio rig in a trailer would be too too difficult for somebody like you <laughs> <laughs> it'll be the most overbuilt trailer home ever it'll look really bad on the outside you walk inside it'll be like Perfect. You don't want anybody to know what's in there. It'll look like it'll look like a, a crap shack. It'll look like a crack shack. Right. <laughs> yeah, and, and stay away from there, boy. Right. And I'll I'll just keep on doing the same stuff I do. I mean, I honestly I'm doing what I love. I I uh, you know get to work with sound, and included in that is developing and working with source elements, and uh, and and I and I think I'll always be working with sound, and that's a big part of where just all the ideas come from is, um, you know, 
being a yep. studio engineer. So circling back, yeah. circling back to the kid that was dissecting a a reel to reel. Yeah, exactly. Just a few years ago, I've gone nowhere, man. <laughs> <laughs> and and yet here we are traveling through through a pipeline right now just so we can do this podcast for you guys. Yeah, man, because you can't handle Chicago weather. Well, who can? I <laughs> really. <laughs> who wants to? I mean, yeah, I grew up there too, dude. I had a paper route. It, right now, when I was a kid, I had a paper route. I'd have my dog, and I had a basket full of freaking newspapers riding through an entire huge neighborhood throwing papers at you know sub-zero weather <laughs> yeah. on, on well, my stingray uh, just like two what is it three a, a week ago not even i'm driving my car and I've, I've got this old um 1986 uh 944 it's like a 80s sports car with pop-up headlights nice so it's cold out and they froze and it it rained right no i turn my lights on and one goes up and the other one stays down it's called winky that's when it's called yeah. winky <laughs> <laughs> dude i still remember if i can ever get out of here man i am so gone <laughs> and and the first time i was in los angeles in my life i was like i'm gonna live here someday well i tried but then shit got real <laughs> real fast when it came to how expensive it is to live there <laughs> yeah I thought I thought about like like New York. I, I had a studio at one time that was looking at um pulling me over to New York and I just remember going like, okay, I've mixed some Super Bowl spots. If I do it again, great. But it just seemed like such a hassle to move to like if I was twenty five living in New York would sure. be the most amazing thing. But then like years later I was like I just want to visit. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Cuz I want I need to be paid so much more to make it actually worth my while. It's just, And I loved going to New yeah. York, but I wouldn't want to live there. I'd, I upstate New York, but you know, that's just cuz I'm, you know, I'm a mountain guy, you know. That's beautiful Ups- there. Yeah. It's yeah. a different thing. Like Manhattan is amazing, but it takes a certain amount of like energy and then you're right. 40. Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you then, know, and I'm I'm blown away for anybody right. that moves in there, you know, in their forties and, and really falls madly in love with Manhattan. You know, uh, that, that takes a special, I mean, it takes a special love for, for some, I mean. And it's an amazing place. Well, sure. I mean, coming like, from Chicago you, to New York, I yeah. mean, it's what it's like Chicago on steroids. It's like a Chicago's yeah, a cow compared. town. Oh, absolutely. To New York. I mean, Chicago to New York is like Indianapolis to Chicago. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's, it's like it's a technically a city, but there there's a scale difference. And New York is just international, like truly international. And it's a um, cool ass. City, it's amazing, man. but <laughs> it's just such a. There's just yeah. <laughs> endless things to do there. It uh, you know the city that never sleeps. Well, yeah. Except now I want to sleep. Yeah, right. and you go do that, and then go ski. <laughs> yes. Robert, thank you so much for joining Creative Flow. Uh, thank, thank you, Rebecca Wilson, um, as well, uh, for coming along. Um, it's going to be really, really cool for people to under, you know, to hear what you guys have created, um, and uh, to see what's see what's coming around the bend for you guys both. I'll be, I'll be happy to see what Source Connect Four looks like. Yeah, it's gonna. Well, it's it's gonna be much more. Actually, is it gonna be? It might not be so green. I'll say that. Okay. That's fine. So it's <laughs> going to get a new like color. Green in a good way. It'll be very green. Like you don't have to travel and use jet fuel to accomplish certain things. But Hey, that's that's the case right now, which is beautiful. Right. But it won't be visually so green, maybe. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Good. Yep. Let's, let's go for purple next time. <laughs> we need more purples. <laughs> All right, brother. Well, thank you for everything cool. you do for me. And for really the world over because you you you're, you guys have been a game changer, brother. You we're guys have been a game we're lucky. Like like to us, it's it's a it's like we're nothing without you guys, honestly. So it's it's the you know it's it's both sides of the, the well, same it, thing. There's nothing without it works. It it, yeah. it it's it's like you said, dude. It solves a problem, you know. And that's what any good product does. You see a problem. Hmm. I think I have a solution. Let's see if this sketty sticks to the wall and you, and you throw it, you know, and it did, it was perfect timing. And, you know, you guys keep, 
you know, you guys keep raising your own bar and that's what keeps you on the map, you know? Oh. Um, I, we could say the same thing about Pro Tools. Sonic Solutions was there first, but Pro Tools saw some yeah. different ways and it took over. And that's right. what happened yeah. with you guys, you know? Exactly. Well, you take good care and I will see you when I get back to Chicago and we'll go uh, dig into some cool. Pita Inn or something better. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll <laughs> like a Pita steak. Inn. As you heard, Rebecca had to leave a little early because she's a busy, busy woman. To take us to the end of the show, that was Robert Marshall from Source Elements. Well, if you didn't know about their story or if you didn't know about the product, you sure do now. I'm Tim Dadabo. Next on our show, we're going to the dogs because I'm interviewing a lady that I work with from Purina. Yes, they have their own in-house advertising agency, and she's going to tell us about her creative sauce that she spills on dog and cat food. Thank you, everybody, for joining us and for supporting Creatives Flow with a VO. So until next time, continue to find your flow.